Hi, and welcome to BTEC 5333, Advanced Bioinformatics. So this is the course that comes out of the Center for Biotechnology and Genomics. And there's a little bit of an addition to this class, and that is computational proteomics. Now, in my opinion, computational proteomics is part of bioinformatics. Uh, but, you know, a lot of people, they think of uh, bioinformatics as typically related to the sequence. So I just decided to add this, uh, this part of the class. A little bit of information about myself. My name is Chiquito Crasto. I'm the instructor for this course. I also am the developer for this course. Uh, you can uh, contact me at uh, chiquito.crasto at ttu.edu or chiquito.crasto at gmail.com. Typically, people use the TTU address, but you know, if for some reason you cannot get me because there's an email outage or something, then the Gmail should work, uh, should work just as fine. So let's think a little bit about the philosophy of the class. Now, uh, this is supposed to be an advanced bioinformatics class, but it's not necessarily. It just presents a different facet of bioinformatics, and that is the, uh, the developmental side of it. And that's, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. This particular class is, uh, is supposed to be a follow-up of BTEC 5322, though it isn't. Okay, so 5322 was a generalized bioinformatics class and it was designed to be uh, available for essentially any biologist. Okay, that if you were an end user, if you wanted to understand bioinformatics from the perspective of bench biology, uh, especially how to use some of the tools, uh, etc., that are available, especially tools that are available on the web. Now, if you wanted to develop bioinformatics, right? For, for somebody like me, I'm a bioinformatics practitioner. So in addition to having all the knowledge of, of, the, of the end user to be able to direct people, to be able to, and again, it's not necessarily that you have to know every resource there is out there, but what the 5322 course taught you was to be not be afraid if there was a learning curve as to, hey, I don't know much about bioinformatics. Well, there's a tool out there that can do a lot of things. Now, when do you come to the second part of bioinformatics, and that is developmental bioinformatics, is because if somebody came to you and a tool is not really available, do you have the ability to develop a tool? Do you have the programming expertise to develop a tool? Um, do you have... Uh, knowledge, for example, to create a model of a protein, something that you can't just drag and drop into, you know, some automated software, though those are actually available, uh, not just into an automated software and then just a structure comes out at you. It, it, it involves a little bit more knowledge. Uh, would you be able to help in that case, right? So this is not really advanced bioinformatics, it's developmental bioinformatics. And at some point, this name, uh, the name of this, the, the course title will have to change. And this is, uh, this is what drives people who specialize in bioinformatics. You don't necessarily have to have the 5322 class to be able to do 5333. You can do them as standalone. You can do them, as, uh, you can do them independently. Uh, you could take one before the other. Uh, people have in the past taken them, and nobody's really, you know, nobody's really poorly affected by it, okay? So let's think in terms of developmental bioinformatics. Now, what I will do is I will give you a quick example of four research projects that my students have done, which actually derived from uh, development of software. Okay, and so the first one was developed by Adnan Ahmed, who is now getting his PhD, uh, but a uh, couple of years uh, was a research associate at the Cornell Medical School after having had his master's degree. So again, I'm not going to run this, um, uh, the, these, uh, the, the YouTube video, you can see it for yourself, but I will give you a kind of a, just a, a snapshot instance of information. So WAPDAP, a wrapper for automated proteomics data analysis pipeline. This was software that was developed by Adnan. And uh, here's what it did. Now, typically when somebody 
you know, wants to do proteomics, metabolomics analysis, they have their experimental data, uh, you know, we run it through our mass spectrometry, a mass spectrometer, or any other resource uh, or any other instrumentation required for proteomics, and then you have raw data in terms of results. Typically, what one would have to do then is run proteomics analysis software. Um, and, you know, that software is, if, it's, if you're lucky, it's menu-driven. You go and click all the, all the things that you want from uh, in terms of the result. And then you take the results of the analysis of the software and do a statistical analysis of it before you get the results. So what, uh, this, what this particular software that Adnan developed was, he wrote a Python program. And that Python program automatically uh, ran this, the proteomics analysis software called MaxQuant, developed at the Max Planck Institute in Germany. And what his software did was it actually executed the program as if the user was actually sitting there and driving the menu. And when you look at the video, you'll be able to see exactly what I'm talking about. Now, what did the user have to do? You know, the user had to just point the software to where the raw data was stored, uh, you know, give their R number, an email address, etc., and that was it. Uh, and there were some few parameters that had to be entered. It was a simple form, a single form, and you hit enter, and the program would take that information, execute the program as if somebody was actually sitting there and clicking stuff on the menu, drop-down boxes, etc. And since the software would take about 24 hours to process, the software would just run by itself. When the software was done executing, all the all the output of that execution was taken and put into a um, into the statistical package part of this process, and it used to execute the process. And then once the results were completely obtained in graphical form, in any form, the uh, in a web page, the user was sent an email saying your results are ready, and now you can go and you know process and look at the results in any form you want. So it was a completely, what WAPDAP did was it had a completely hands-off approach. It did all the work that even a proteomics uh, expert analyst, analyst would do. It just did it in a completely hands-off way. Okay, and so I will introduce, um, I will you know include the YouTube video The next uh, project was uh, by Adrian Quintana, who's currently in uh, working in industry. Uh, after he graduated, he worked uh, at Texas Tech for a while. Uh, and his, uh, his project involves cancer pathway visualization and analysis. And once again, uh, this video, which I will include, it's a partial presentation. It's not the complete presentation. So just to explain what he did, uh, there are uh, biological pathways at a resource called KEGG, K-E-G-G, uh, Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genomes, uh, Genes and Genomes. And, you know, it's, it's a resource which is biological pathways. You can put a gene information in there and it tells you which pathways uh, that gene belongs to. Uh, you can click on a pathway, you can get a visual, a visual feel of the pathway. And in that visual field of the pathway, you can actually click on a gene and it tells you more information about that gene or the gene or the gene product. So what he did was he found the biological pathways for 15 different cancers. And he took those 15 different cancers and he, he uh, used a software called Cytoscape, which allowed him to merge. And of course, uh, you know, he wrote a lot of uh, Python programs to actually make this work. And then he, uh, he took those biological pathways and he merged them using Cytoscape, such that uh, no matter how many times a gene was represented in different uh, cancers, that gene or the sub-pathway was only represented once in the merged pathway. So it was almost like you could, if you identified a gene, you could actually identify which, uh, how many different pathways pass to the gene. So rather than the name of the pathway or the name of the cancer being the main point, the gene was actually the pivot point in that merged pathway. And I'll, you know, and obviously I will soon include a demonstration, a demonstration of that pathway. And so that uh, eventually once we created this merged pathway, we said, well, it, the best way to be able to 
to uh, present this to the community is to do it, uh, to have a version on the web. So we began working with the graphics experts at the computer science department at Texas Tech, and they took the entire pathway. And Adrian, of course, did a lot of the work, but they, uh, they helped us get the pathway on on onto the on the internet. And I will include a um, I will include a link. Uh, in fact, that link that you see that uh, is is the GitHub link is is uh, something that will enable you to visualize the pathway. And I will include a short demonstration of that pathway. So that was a presentation up to uh, the use of Cytoscape, which allowed him to merge the networks. Uh, and I'm going to give you a very quick demonstration, just a few seconds of the work that he did to complete the project. That is where we worked with uh, Professors Tommy Dang and his graduate student, uh, uh, Vin Nguyen, who actually, uh, and they worked with Adrian, helped him to uh, put uh, the network pathways on the web. Okay, so let's go take a look at that. So let's have a quick demonstration of the resource that Adrian developed with his colleagues and collaborators at Texas Tech University. This is a result of the merged pathways and you can see the cancers are on the right and there are different 15 cancers each of these pathways. The size of these circles are representative of the number of genes that are associated with each pathway and they are color coded and we'll see exactly what those color codes means. Now you can expand this pathway so you can see a little bit more about this pathway and you again it's just a matter of using the middle mouse button. Now if you want for example to see and once again as I mentioned the each of these genes is um, each of these genes is represented only once and it becomes the pivot point of the uh, through which pathways, uh, the biological pathways or sub pathways flow. Okay, so let's say if I click on breast cancer, you'll see all the genes that are associated with breast cancer with the breast cancer pathway. Okay, I could then go to, for example, renal cell cancer and I can then see all the all the genes associated with pathways with renal cell cancer. Now I can hold the control button and I can click both and this will not only highlight for me the breast cancer and the renal cell cancer uh, genes but the dark circles are representative of the genes that are common to both cancers or genes that show up in pathways of both cancers okay there is a resource here which also says you can you can choose the type of gene and that gene you can actually very specifically see where that gene is in the in the pathway you can hold the control button and see various genes so where these genes are you could select all and you can go back to the original and you can deselect everything Okay, so that's one thing. Now let's just go again to, you know, for example, in terms of the discovery. Okay, so you see the breast cancer. And then what I'm going to do is I'm also going to highlight using the control button, prostate cancer. Now, breast cancer is, and this is what I mean by sometimes you develop a tool. It's not just the utility of the tool, but it becomes a vehicle for, um, a vehicle for original discovery which maybe people had not anticipated. So if I look at prostate cancer, now prostate cancer obviously is very specific to males, and breast cancer is largely in females, though breast cancer is uh, uh, afflicts men too. What is interesting, however, is a disease that is, pre that is prevalent among females and a disease that's exclusive to males have so many genes in common. And not only do they have genes in common, they have pathways which are therefore in common. Okay, and this is an interesting, uh, this is an interesting way of, uh, of kind of making discovery. So if you go back to the original uh, pathway and you mouse, let me expand so we can see, let's say the ELK gene, and you mouse over on this gene, uh, it will give you several links Okay, so that's, that, tells, that sends you back to the link in the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes, 
uh, that'll tell you more about that gene. You can go, for example, to the NCBI, it'll tell you more about the genes. If you click on the orange button, it'll go to gene cards. If you click on the on the E, which is the ensemble, which is the um, which is the European Bioinformatics Institute uh, uh, gene resource. So the question then is: This not only becomes a uh, um, a, a merged pathway tool, but it also says if you have a gene that is of interest to you, you can then go to various resources which are associated with these genes and find out more about that gene. The kite-shaped compounds are compounds that facilitate the pathway, okay, compounds that are associated with the pathway, but not necessarily genes. And this, I thought, is a useful quick demonstration. While we use different resources at the basis, uh, the creation of these pathways, so you, even when you leverage the Cytoscape uh, merged pathway resource, is actually, is Python was used a lot in this, in this particular process. Okay, and that's all I have to say in terms of the demonstration of this. But again, uh, the person who did this work, Adrian Quintana, uh, you know, he took the same, uh, same class as you are taking. The next project was, uh, it, it has, is somewhat related to my, my research. And uh, this was work done by Sarah Hoppy. One of the interesting parts of the research that I do is it's in the area of olfactory receptors. Now, olfactory receptors are the largest uh, gene family in the human genome. Uh, there's, uh, you know, 400 functional, 400 give or take uh, functional olfactory receptor genes, and they're all present in our nose. And what they do is they interact with molecules of smell and they take, uh, the, you know, they, they pass a signal which then is passed to the olfactory processing part of the brain, which is about here. And that information uh, is then processed in the brain. And then we have the result is the perception of smell. Now, this could be separate odorants. This could also be odors, which is, you know, a combination of odorants, which and one of them represents an odor or they all combine to produce an odor. Now, uh, what Sarah did was she uh, ran this, uh, she wrote some Python programs and she created software which, um, which uh, r reduced the dimensionality of an entire uh, olfactory receptor gene sequence to a single point in three-dimensional space. And we took different parts of, you know, different types of uh, re receptor genes, different parts of receptor genes, etc., and we represented the entire cluster of these receptors in three-dimensional space. And so you can see that distribution, and again, not to belabor the point of this project, but uh, you know, different colors mean different things. Again, we have several of these clusters. This is just an illustrative point um, for this uh, for this work. Okay, and so again, a lot of the work that uh, that was done was involved involved uh, original Python programming. With Christian Jimenez, uh, who is also currently working in industry, uh, we we did a project called RAST, which is uh, finding repeat amino acids uh, in in proteins, and so um, this, uh, if you if you actually kind of look very carefully at a protein sequence, you'll find that there are repeat regions, you know, amino acid motifs of three, four, five, six, which repeat throughout the protein. And some of these have been implicated in, in certain disease. So we decided to do a comprehensive study of um, of repeat regions in, in proteins. And what Christian did was he actually uh, wrote a web application which allows uh, allows people to you know for example input a sequence into you know into a text box on the web and then it immediately processes that sequence and it gives you um, gives you the repeat regions now some things to think about okay so for example uh, we have to un recognize that for example only one representation of a repeat region okay there should be only one that means that we there should be only one representation of a repeat unit so if a re repeat unit is let's say APA uh, alanine proline alanine is repeated several times it should you know, we don't have to re mention it every time it repeats, but we have to say this is a repeat region. Now, let's say, for example, there's a five amino acid repeat region. Right? Let's call it AAPAA, alanine, alanine, proline, alanine, alanine. And, um, but 
if we identify that as a five repeat region, then you'll realize that there is also a, um, there is, uh, it will also show up as a four repeat region, right? Which is AAPA. And then there will be another four repeat region that is APAA, okay? And then also there'll be three repeat regions, right? AAP, APA, uh, PAA, these are the three amino acid repeat regions. But we, we, we also had to filter, write the software in such a way that if, for example, a five amino acid repeat region was, was identified, then it's, it's kind of these three repeat and four repeat, which are part of these five should not be considered. Okay, so it was only the longest, longest region was considered. Another thing that we did was we said, let's calculate what are the probability of an amino acid to lie in a repeat region? And we call it a propensity because we're not just going to say, oh, I'm just going to count all the amino acids that, uh, that arise in a, uh, in a uh, repeat region. We have to make sure that when we count how many amino acids or the percentage of amino acids in a repeat region, we have to normalize it against the amino acid distribution in the entire protein. And we have to do that because, let's say glycine, for example, is the most most occurring amino acids in protein. So we have to say, well, that means it's very likely that glycine will also have a high percentage of being in repeat regions. But that is that because it's part of a repeat region, something special about glycine to be part of a repeat region versus, uh, you know, so if, if on the other hand, the glycine shows up many times because it's also distributed to the rest of the protein in the non-repeating uh, non -repeating regions, that's why, that's why we have to normalize it, okay? So all of this had to be thought about. And then we said, well, if we can do this for an entire, the propensities for a one protein, why don't, why don't we just add, uh, you know, do the propensity of an amino acid to lie in, in, for example, all the proteins in a proteome? Okay, so all of this work was done by Christian Jimenez, and it was, uh, and you know, it was done in, in actually pretty short time. So let's say, for example, we downloaded um, this uh, amino, this amino acid sequence from from GenBank, and it, it it came from mouse. And what we did was we created what is called a RAST sequence. Now this is a hypothetical sequence. Biologically, it doesn't mean much, but this sequence, the one in red, is composed of only the repeat region occurring only once and only the longest sequence of repeat regions. Okay, so we created this sequence. And then once we created this sequence, we were able to then count, um, you know, the occurrence of uh, the probability of the occurrence of every of amino acids in this region, then distributed against, uh, you know, for example, this, uh, this region, okay, uh, that is the entire the entire protein. Uh, and so we, that's how we calculated the probe. And then we repeated this for human, then the typical models like the mouse model, melanogaster, that's worm, uh, so C. elegans worm, so uh, melanogaster, which is a fruit fly, zebra fish, etc. And, uh, you know, this uh, was also uh, presented in a pretty well-received uh, well -received, uh, poster session uh, with my collaborator, Stephen Barnes of the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Now, that's not really immediately a challenge for us, you know, but if you put this information out there, somebody is going to take a look at it and say, hey, this is, uh, this is interesting. This is, uh, this is something that, uh, you know, this is something that we could actually recognize. This is something we could actually use. Now, there's something else we did. Uh, you know, if you do the propensities at a proteome level, you'll also be able to, for example, go to Uniprot, the big protein resource, and say, I want all the proteins are related to human cancers, and then you can separate it into various cancers. So all the proteins that are implicated in the various cancers will show up. And so then, you know, for example, if we compared the human uh, proteome to all cancers to just, for example, bladder cancer, and Christian actually in his project report, he actually, he showed uh, all the you know, different kinds of cancers, you then have to ask yourself, you know, what are the propensity of an amino acid to lie in a particular um, uh, you know, in uh, in a particular cancer, and once again, you know, if you if you look at the trends, and the trends are about the same, we have to consider that okay, uh, the trends might be the same, but but you know, let's look for the ones that are different. So, for example, here, you know, tryptophan has a really low number for uh, for the human proteome that we know uh, from the previous slide, but you know, it's relatively high uh, when it comes to it's higher for bladder cancer.
very interesting, right? Uh, alternatively, here, if you look at uh, threonine, um, the uh, all cancers and the human, the, pro the propensities are closer to one. So that it's a little high, but not that much higher. But ex on the other hand, in bladder cancer, you'll find threonines in, uh, in uh, repeat regions significantly higher. So these are the kinds of patterns that we generally we generally are looking for okay and again you know there's not much we can do with it but certainly an oncologist might take a look at it uh, so you know some a proteomic specialist uh, somebody who does protein biochemistry uh, with a view to cancer might actually look at this and say hey this is very interesting this is very different why am i bringing this up okay certainly none of none of the presentations of the f you know few slides before uh, are you know, it's immediately relevant to this class or what we're going to learn. But the reason I brought this up is to give you a glimpse. Very often we just say, well, as a bioinformatics person, I'm going to use that software and I'm going to go online. And by the way, I did some next generation sequencing and I get all my data and I have to process the data based on software that somebody else has created, etc. This is an example. Uh, as I said, this class is more aptly, should more aptly be called as um, developmental bioinformatics, right? And so notice that none of these resources, none of the things that were created uh, by these four, by the four students here, uh, had anything to do with using resources somewhere else. Yes, they, you, you know, we downloaded data, etc. But each of these resources is standalone and unique and not available anywhere else. So again, bioinformatics is not just a, you know, okay, use tools that somebody else has developed, but you can build your own tools. And if you have a scientific question, uh, and if you understand something about programming, etc., cetera, and you, you can't find the tool somewhere else, the idea is that you should be able to at least put the effort towards developing your own tool. Okay, and again, that's what we talk about, right? We're not saying that at the end of this, you're going to be an expert, uh, an expert uh, programmer, though you certainly can be if that's your interest. But uh, you'll see that there is a, um, uh, you might not be an expert, but what you will do is you will, you will learn enough, you will know enough to at least ask the right questions. So for example, when Adrian Quintana developed his merged pathways, we said, well, uh, you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel if we want to put this online. Let's go to the best people at Texas Tech who will put this stuff, uh, you know, who are capable of putting this stuff online because they don't understand anything of biological processes because that's not the area of research or work or experience. But we can go to them and say, here's the data. What is the most efficient way to put it online? And, you know, that's that's how we work with, work with other people. You'll be able to straddle you know, both the programming side of it, the informatics side of it, as well as the bio side of it. And that's that places you in a very unique position, okay? So let's go from there. So the basic breakdown of the curriculum is like this, okay? So there'll be essentially three parts to it. And the first one is you're going to learn Python programming. Now remember, this is not a Python programming class. It is, it allows you to learn Python just enough so that you can actually execute BioPython. And this is the real strength of, you know, you can't just say, well, I'm going to run a Python, BioPython, but I don't know any Python. So this Python, the Python that you're going to learn in this class actually teaches you enough to be able to run BioPython. And, you know, uh, if you've never done this, you'll actually, if you have some bio knowledge, once you run bio, uh, do BioPython, you'll realize how valuable, how valuable this is. Okay, if we have time, we might actually uh, learn a little bit about web-based Python programming, how to create web apps and things like that. Uh, then uh, this is where uh, students from the transcriptomics class, which is Dr. Fokar is teaching and he also teaches uh, uh, next generation sequencing and that would be uh, gene expression analysis. People from those two classes will actually join our class for three uh, things, and they'll have data, or we'll be, we'll give you data, and we'll take you through the uh, through the data analysis through the data analysis process. Okay, and the fourth part is what we talked about in addition to this class, and that's uh, computational proteomics and four lectures. And here we'll be joined by the students who are taking protein engineering. The last four lectures will be will involve uh, computational proteomics. And uh, what we're doing here is we're creating computational models of proteins. Uh, you know, we will visualize, learn how to visualize biomolecules, and then we'll do an exercise in protein ligand docking. So, for example, bind a small molecule to a to a 
to a protein in the best conformation and the best configuration. Um, uh, the mainstay of all of drug discovery in the in the uh, pharmaceutical industry, uh, the the computational side of it, uh, y you know, you'll get a flavor of computational proteomics. Uh, in terms of evaluation, uh, you know, the midterm will be announced. It will be uh, it'll be a take home to our midterm, uh, and uh, and then there will be, uh, you know, towards the end of the, uh, the course, you will have to develop a bioinformatics uh, programming project. Uh, you know, it'll be, it'll go beyond what you've learned uh, in, in anything. You know, you'll, you'll ask a question, you'll attempt to solve it using programming. And I think this is really a good experience uh, for you to actually learn how to do a develop, developing. And, you know, somewhere in the middle of the class, you'll actually tell me what your, what your intended project is. Uh, and that'll be the extent of the programming part of this project. Um, uh, the take-home midterm, uh, depending on when we have it, might include a little bit of... Uh, uh, you know, a little bit of um, uh, programming related to next generation sequencing, etc. Now, the take home final will mostly involve, you know, you having to build a model of a protein given a sequence, and you'll have to, uh, you know, drag and drop a ligand into it uh, uh, using using the docking processes. Now, uh, you know, on Blackboard, you'll be, quizzes will be given to you, homeworks will be given to you, uh, some of these will be timed, uh, etc. You know, and I'll, the due dates will all be will all be mentioned. Okay. Uh, again, up to up to the programming, uh, up to the bi uh, the uh, the project part, everything that'll involve will write uh, will involve writing programs, except for the protein modeling part. Now, the protein modeling part is very interesting because you'll actually have uh, you will actually run Python scripts. Uh, this this. Uh, is written in, in, in Python. So it's there's an advantage to that because the shell or the script that you will do is you will begin to recognize and understand it and if there's any errors you'll you'll be able to you'll be able to fix it.